What's up everyone, Joseph Parker here and you're watching Boxing Social. This is Rob Tebbett for Boxing Social. I'm delighted to be joined once again by David Higgins, promoter from Duco Events and promoter of Joseph Parker. How are you, David? I'm great, thank you, and it's good to be back on Boxing Social. It's always a pleasure to have you here. Uh, one of the first sit-down interviews I actually did, well, not the first, but one of the certainly one of the longest I did, was six months ago when you were over for the, jo the Joshua Parker negotiations. Um, seems like a lifetime ago. Lots happened since then. Certainly ha it does seem like a lifetime, but that's boxing. You know, it's a sport of highs and lows, and a lot happens in six months. So tell me a little bit about that, that period of six months. Obviously, we've seen Joseph Parker face Anthony Joshua unsuccessfully, losing his WBO World Heavyweight title. Um, what's happened other than that in the last six months? How are you a different Dave Higgins now than the one that I sat down with six months ago? Oh, um, you, you, you get a thicker skin with experience. And so, you know, I had some experience in the New Zealand market running major promotions, doing media. The UK is all new, so you're a little bit more nervous coming in. I think... I'm shy by nature, but as a boxing promoter, you have to thrust yourself into the public. I am be provocative sometimes, and so that, that whole Anthony Joshua has a glass jaw strategy, I'd a hunch it would work, but it felt uncomfortable doing it. And people, you, you, you sort of, you don't really want to do it, but we did it and it, we got the fights and it was, we wouldn't change anything. Um, <clears throat> and so we're getting used to the UK market, um, more confident, it's becoming like a second home for a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, a chance meeting with David Hay near the Greenfell Tower, where he offered us the use of his gym and um, use of this hotel, which we've now used three times. So it's becoming like, feels like we're fighting at home just about. And then Joseph's so accommodating and nice with the fans and the media that that comes across. He's hard to dislike. And so the, the British fans seem to like Joseph and, and the team. So um, it almost feels like a home fight and like Dillian White's enemy. <clears throat> That's actually something I spoke to uh, with Joseph the other day when I sat down and interviewed him. He is extremely well liked. Um, have you noticed any differences with, obviously in your role as promoter, I'm very careful not to, to talk too much about boxing because I know you make it clear that that's not your game, but from a promotional point of view, are there any differences for you with him coming off the back of a loss? Has, has, his, has his popularity or has his marketability dipped at all since he's lost his title to Joshua? Well, look, um, this is the second best deal I've done for, for Joseph Park or our team has done. So it's, it's interesting coming off a loss. It's a big event. It's sold out O2 Arena. It's on British Sky Sport. So I think Joseph earned some, despite the, the loss to Joshua, he did earn some respect in the way he conducted himself. There was genuine concern over the referee, even from Eddie Hearn, Anthony Joshua's promoter, <clears throat> described the referee's performance as appalling. Um, so I think, um, no, I think Joseph's still got brand equity in, in this market. I mean, it's going to be important how he goes Saturday night. I think if he can win the Saturday by knockout, his brand equity would be quite high and people would say he legitimately deserves another shot against Joshua and has earned it. Obviously, if it goes the other way, there's a lot of rebuilding to do. And, it, you know, if you're coming off two losses, it's a long road back. And that it's a mark of our confidence and, I guess, risk-taking that we'd rather go straight in again than, than to pad with softer fights. Tell me a little bit about that, because it seems to me that in modern day boxing, people are, are rather cautious, particularly coming off the back of a loss. Um, I think I'm correct in saying that you would have had a number of other opportunities to, to pursue with Joseph Parker coming off the back of, albeit a loss, still in, an, in a unified heavyweight title fight. How important was it for you to put him back in at the deep end, as it were, live on Sky Sports box office against a dangerous opponent like Dillian White, as opposed to taking two or three tune-ups back home in New Zealand? Boxing's a risk-return game. Um, to, three tune-ups in New Zealand might have made less money than this one fight. And with the three tune-ups, you risk losing anyway, or injuring, and you, your fight won't be get the exposure. So you're weighing up all of this, and um, Dillian... For a confident boxer and team, Dillian was a no-brainer in terms of um, the market it's in, the profile it'll generate, 
the, the money it'll generate. Um, of course, there's risk, but there, there always is risk. Um, <clears throat> and we back Joseph Parker, and he backs himself. With the Anthony Joshua fight, uh, the negotiations dragged on for a long time. You've alluded to it at the start of this this interview with with the sort of the fun and games, as it were, in the media. Um, something I spoke to Joseph about in the past was was the press conference and what have you. That was a very long, drawn out process. It seems like this deal came along very, very quickly. Certainly took the majority, if not all, of the boxing fraternity by surprise. What was the difference? Why did this deal take seemingly no time in comparison? Yeah, the, the deals were opposites. Um, with Joshua, you have two companies on opposite, opposite sides of the world, Matchroom and Duco Events, who've never worked together, trying to execute a deal that's worth tens of millions in, in, in money. And they, they're feeling each other out. They don't <clears throat> know how much they can trust each other, etc., which is normal. Um, but then we just worked well together behind the scenes. I found Matchroom to be professional, straightforward, reasonable, probably the best promoter I've worked with. And Eddie Hearn and his team cop a bit of flack around the place, but I think unfairly so. They're good for the boxing. And I hope their DAZN play dominates the world because they're, they're fair and they're growing the sport. So I think having had that experience, it, it then set up this to be quite a, a much more simple negotiation because the trust was there, the contract templates are there to roll, and um, and then you go on instinct. And um, so we, we did execute the, the deal pretty quick, the, the general terms in 48 odd hours, on a handshake really. I mean, Parker and I flew to the UK for the announcement on a, on a handshake, um, but we've had no problems with Matchroom, and, and I'd like to think they've had no problems with us. I mean, obviously we, we want our Joseph Parker to win and they want Dillian White to win, but at the end of the day, it's a business as well, and the two organisations were able to execute that deal quickly, having had that Joshua experience. Talk to me a little bit about dealing with Eddie Hearn. Um, in the past, I've spoken to you, you've labelled him the best promoter in the world currently. Um, as you say, he does cop a lot of flack, rightly or wrongly, from, from members of the boxing community. Why do you think that is, and what's your experience of working with him behind the scenes? I, I don't think he's in it for the ego or the money. Um, he doesn't really, probably doesn't need the money. And as for ego, um, often you'll, you'll argue with promoters over, I want my logo on the show, I want a pro promotion. No, 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 your logo is set on mine. With Matchroom, I don't even ask. And they just chuck the Duco logo up next to the Matchroom logo. I don't sense that he's ego driven. I think he wants, he's, it's creativity. You want to see what you can do. Can you build more world champions? Can you grow the sport? Can you dominate the United States? I think there's a bigger vision at play, which, is, and, and you know, I, I'm on a much smaller scale, but I think for me, it's creative as well. Trying to dream up a deal like the Joshua fight or, or White, figuring out how you make it happen and then putting the steps in place to try and make it happen. That, there's a satisfaction in making big complex deals happen um, <clears throat> so so I think that some of the flack that Eddie Hearn cops is, is unfair and um, probably because he's on TV a lot and he's he comes across a little bit twatty sometimes so, sorry Eddie <laughs> nah, but so do I you no never David no 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 um, staying with that one of the things that I'll, I'll never forget you telling me was your whole train wreck theory um, the first time I was introduced to you was at the infamous Huey Fury press conference where you were escorted uh, from the premises by members of security. Um, you later told me that that was all a ploy, as it were, to raise interest for the fight, to bring in to bring in pay-per-view numbers. That was YouTube pay-per-view. Uh, we didn't see an awful lot of that in the Joshua Parker fight. Can we expect to see some of that this week? You can't contrive too much. Um, in, the in the Fury fight, it happened naturally because we were genuinely outraged that, that um, <clears throat> the home referee was selected who refereed Huey Fury's last two bouts. It was an outrage, and the fight wasn't getting much media, and so it sort of killed two birds with one stone, put the fight on the map, and raised the profile of the issue with the referee. Um, but, you know, if there's no outrage, I think if things are contrived, it, it doesn't have... It can almost damage the credibility. So... If I was going to act crazy this time, I'm not sure quite what I'd do or act crazy about. I think we'll leave the crazy to Dillian White because it's already there. He was born crazy. 
Just saying with that, um, I haven't actually watched The Gloves Are Off between Dillian White and Joseph Parker, but something I spoke to Joseph about the other day is that there hadn't, prior to that, um, from what I'm told, seemed to be that much trash talk from Dillian White in the build-up to this fight. Why do you think that is? Um, can you, are you expecting to see more of that this week? As you just mentioned, in your opinion, he's crazy. Are we, are we expecting to see some of that side? And, and why haven't we seen it so far? I think it's a, a, a mark that Dillian has taken the fight deadly seriously. He's focusing more on his training, doesn't want to stick his neck out too much. He's respecting Joseph Parker. But he, Dillian would genuinely think he can beat Joseph Parker and earn his rematch against Joshua. So it's, it's um, yeah, we, we probably expected a bit more trash talk from Dillian and who knows what the final week will, will hold. Do you take that as a compliment? <coughs> the fact that there hasn't been that, that levelled at Joseph Park? It's something I spoke to Joseph about the other day. It's, he's a very, very cool character. Do you think Dillian White has had a look at him and thought, there's not really much point here or do you think it's just, just one of those things and he is just focusing on his training? I think Joseph's difficult to trash talk because he's so nice and well-rounded and all, hum, you know, um, you'd, you'd look like a bit of an asshole if you went too hard. But also, I think Dillian is just taking it very seriously. So it's going to be a, a cracker. It could be the heavyweight fight of the year. I mean, Dillian comes in swarming punches, but leaving openings. Joseph said openly he's going to bring more, way more intent, maybe throw the kitchen sink. So it's going to be explosive. Just backtrack to what you said about the referee uh, or the yeah the home referee in the Huey Fury fight. Obviously the Anthony Joshua fight, the referee, Italian referee, his name escapes me. Um, Giuseppe Quarteroni. Giuseppe Quarteroni, thank you very much. At least one of us has done their due diligence. Um, yeah, talk to me a little bit about that and why was the, why is it important that this doesn't happen again in this fight? What measures are you taking or what measures have you taken to make sure that doesn't affect this fight between Joseph Parker and Dillian White? Well, there's nothing we can do to control the performance of the referee on the night. It will be what it will be. But for the sake of the credibility of the British boxing, I hope there isn't another disgrace. Um, you know, the referee that I've heard the name mentioned around um, is someone that our trainer is happy with. And, you know, I think we've arrived at a position where it was so bad last time we take a competent British referee over an incompetent ring-in from somewhere like Italy. Um, you know, neutrality is important, but competence is more important. <clears throat> I think the referee is Ian John Lewis, who is um, who's certainly well known on these shores. Um, is the Anthony Joshua rematch where you go next? Obviously, Joseph and Kevin, I'm sure, are not looking past this weekend against Dillian White. Your job as a promoter, I know, is to potentially look at deals that are, that are past what you've got coming up. Is the Anthony Joshua rematch what you would like after this Saturday, or are there are other avenues you'd be willing to explore? Look, if, if we if we were to earn the win, then yes, we'd, we'd like a rematch with Anthony Joshua. Um, we've never shied away. We think there's unfinished business. We think if we beat Dillian, even, say, by knockout, then we could legitimately call for a rematch. Um, so that, that would be right up the top of our agenda. Should the fight not go the way that you're, you're hoping, expecting, planning this weekend against Dillian White, how damaging would that potentially be to Joseph Parker, the commodity, as opposed to the fighter? I think people would lose, a lot of people would lose faith and say, you know, like what happened with Audley Harrison, and it'll be, it's there for a long road back. It will test Joseph's resolve to, you know, really come back. But, you know, then you look at Vladimir Klitschko, didn't he lose three before his 10-year reign? That's quite unusual to lose three but then be dominant for 10 years. So it can be done, but it's a hard thing to do. I think if, we, if, we, if that happened, we'd have to really sit down and have a good soul search and decide where to from here. Back to Eddie Hearn. Um, you mentioned that you alluded to his DAZN deal. Um, as somebody who's not privy to these types of deals and negotiations, as I'm sure you have a far better insight than I am, can you just explain how important that is and sort of the mechanics behind a deal like that and whether or not you'd be willing to have some of your fighters on the platform? I think the deal could be a game changer because in, in technology businesses, players rise to the top and become dominant. Facebook and social networking Google and search engine, Netflix for drama and entertainment. No one's done it in sport. 
Um, Al Heyman kind of tried to own boxing <clears throat> and failed, and he did it with borrowed money from a pension fund. So he's reporting back to boards and pension funds. I think he was giving away TV rights without money coming in, etc. The difference here is I believe the funding backer has very, very deep pockets, multi-billion billionaire, which means they can take a, a 20 year view. I think if you're trying to own boxing or change a sport, you can't be doing it on borrowed money with a two year view. It's a, but if you've got deep pockets and you can be patient enough to wait 20 years, <clears throat> you could fundamentally change the sport. So what you have is a, um, someone that has identified there's an opportunity to become the Netflix of sport, if you like, and he's buying rights around the world and he's done a deal with Eddie on boxing and putting an unprecedented amount of funding behind it. Now, Eddie's a good promoter and has a good business model, and the um, investor has very deep pockets and a long-term view. So chances are they'll succeed, and I personally would like to see them succeed. Back to this fight. <clears throat> this Saturday, Dillian White and Joseph Parker fight on Sky Sports box office. Um, attracted a lot of criticism in the boxing fraternity about it being pay-per-view. Um, have you caught wind of that, and what are your views on that? Oh, look, I think I sense a lot of excitement from a lot of fans. There'll always be critics. The critics of every fight, so not too worried about that. I think most people know it's going to be explosive. Okay, and just finally back to Eddie Hearn and, and Deontay Wilder and Anthony Joshua. It kind of reminds me a little bit of the Joseph Parker, Anthony Joshua negotiations. It's all very public. It's all very <coughs> protracted. Uh, at times, the back and forth has been mainly between promoters as opposed to fighters. What are your views on that deal and, and, and the way that it has been put out in the media? I don't think it's been put out in the media for show. I think it's genuine acrimonious negotiation that is in the media. I think that the reason the fight hasn't happened is pure greed on the Wilder side. Um, let's look at the facts. Joshua is a commercial juggernaut. He has two or three world titles. He, or four, he, he sells out a stadium of 80,000 people and has done so more than once. Wilder has one world title. He's got a padded record. He hasn't even sold out his hometown arena in Alabama. It's probably 12, 15,000. So for him to be reaching 50% or anywhere close to it is a joke. And um, so I don't think it's a case of Joshua dodging the fight. It's a case of the Wilder side being greedy and not being realistic. And, and Eddie and the WBA, I think, called their bluff and they're fighting Povetkin. Probably. And after, let's say Joshua beats Povetkin, I think if Wilder pisses around again, their bluff will be called again, and I'd say the winner of Parker White will end up in Wembley on April 14, rather than Wilder. And for Wilder, that opportunity might slip away, so Wilder will be under pressure to bring his expectations down to earth. <coughs> is asking for 50% of the deal, I mean, this is something that, that Eddie Hearn has said, and he actually said it previously about yourselves, with, um, with I think, Joseph initially asking for 40% or 45% of the purse. Is asking for, in Eddie Hearn's opinion and your own, sort of an extraordinarily high percentage of the purse, is that a way of avoiding the fight? Is that a way of trying to take sort of the media high ground, as it were? No, it's a way of trying to grab as much cash as you can while you can. So, Wilder, in a way, it's almost Wilder not backing himself, saying, I might lose, so I need to grab as much pound of flesh as I can out of this one fight, and as back as Heyman, etc., Shelley Finkel. They're, they're trying to grab as much money as they can out of what they see as their big opportunity. If they really backed Wilder, they'd probably be less worried about the percentage. Was that ultimately, ultimately what drove you to take in the Anthony Joshua fight? You felt that that you obviously got the best deal for your client that was available at the time, but you felt that Joseph Parker would ultimately defeat Anthony Joshua? We were confident we could beat Anthony Joshua, and we also thought the deal was good for us, but not so stupid it was disrespectful to Joshua and Eddie Hearn and what they've built. So that deal got made because both sides were reasonable and made the deal. The Wilder-Joshua deal will get made when Wilder pulls his head in, and, and not before then. <clears throat> Okay, and just finally, David, because I appreciate that you only got in this weekend, I do appreciate your time this morning. Um, talk to our fans or talk to fans of boxing about who maybe 
on the fence as to whether or not to, to purchase Joseph Parker versus Dillian White this Saturday, what can fans expect at the O2 Arena? They expect Dillian White to walk forward swarming bombs with openings, Joseph to trade back, skirmishes, maybe a knockdown, and probably finish by stoppage in the middle round somewhere. Any train wrecks this week? Dillian White. <laughs> OK, well, David Higgins of Duco Events, thanks very much for speaking to Boxing Social. Always a pleasure catching up with you. Look forward to seeing you. It's this week, it's not next week. It's Dillian White versus Joseph Parker. Thanks very much for speaking to Boxing Social. Thank you. Cheers. Appreciate it.